Okay, welcome to the photosynthesis lecture. Uh, this is chapter 10, take 2. Hopefully a little more appropriate. All right, so new info. Hopefully you all caught this in the previous video, but wavelength is abbreviated with a good old lambda there. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum is going to be a big thing we're going to be talking about. This is basically just all the energy released from stars. comes in a variety of flavors. There's x-rays, gamma rays, infrared, uh, radio waves, microwaves, right? There's a lot of different kinds of energy released from stars. Uh, and the wavelength of that specific energy determines what kind it is, right? Wavelength, right, when we're drawing waves, yeah, it's doing a weird thing. Anyway, the wavelength is a measurement between crests, like that. So, the specific wavelength, whether it's long or whether it's very short, determines just what kind of energy we classify it as. Visible light is wavelengths of 350 to 750 nanometers. So here's a nice little slide showing how we measure wavelength up here. Uh, and then down here, we see an explanation of wavelength. So um, we have uh, Gamma rays right here. X rays. So these are high weight or uh, large value, or how do I want to say it? Small, very small wavelengths. Uh, so wavelengths measured in the 0. 0.0001 nanometer range, right? X rays get as uh, high a wavelength as 10 nanometers. Here's ultraviolet. And this tiny little range between about uh, 350 to about 800 over here is the visible light. Uh, as we get a larger wavelength there, we get into infrared and we get into radio waves. That includes radar, television, FM, and then way over here in the very large wavelength, AM. Uh, so, um, high energy wavelengths are the shorter wavelengths. These are where we find our extremely high energy. But high energy wavelengths don't penetrate, as, or they go shorter distances. So they carry a lot of energy, but they don't go as far. Whereas here are longer wavelengths, right? These wavelengths will travel vast difference, uh, distances. That's why a lot of our telescopes are radio telescopes, uh, so that we can sense uh, energy coming off of stars from different galaxies. AM radio you can use to contact uh, almost anybody on the, well, not AM, but shortwave radio tends to be able to go all over the planet. AM uh, travels far distances, but doesn't carry um, sound quality very well. It's only mono, uh, but that's sound stuff. So let's get past that. Anyway, uh, here we have again the visible light spectrum. So again, we have uh, gamma rays. We have X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwaves, and radio. So, um, visible light is what we're going to be using when we talk about photosynthesis. So, some quick definitions to make this lecture easier. Photosynthesis is basically the taking of inorganic components and using them to create organic fuel, in this case, glucose. This is endergonic, which means it requires energy, specifically free energy. Organisms that do photosynthesis are classified as autotrophs. 
auto meaning self and troph meaning feeder. Uh, heterotrophs can be contrasted with the autotrophs um, simply by saying, you know, recognizing the, uh, the Latin uh, prefixes. Hetero means other. Uh, so these are organisms that eat or have to consume other organisms, whether it's dead things, uh, whether it's um, uh, live things, right? So you could be a decomposer and be a heterotroph because you're decomposing dead things, or you could be a tiger and be a heterotroph because you're eating other things. Either way, heterotrophs eat other things, whereas autotrophs feed themselves. And specifically, our autotrophs are photosynthetic ones that we're talking about today. And the specific ones we're talking about are taking inorganic materials and synthesizing glucose. So let's hit some details. There's a variety of organisms that can photosynthesize. You have you bacteria, the true bacteria from domain bacteria. Uh, life is separated into three separate domains. We have archaea. Uh, we have bacteria. And we have the eukaryotes. So bacteria are the the true, true bacteria, which is why we have the prefix EU for true. Anyway, cyanobacteria. Ooh, this all got in the way. Um, cyanobacteria are the true bacteria that can do photosynthesis. Uh, so, um, there we go. Cyanobacteria are the photosynthesizers that come from you bacteria. They were the first photosynthesizers, by the way, and they were largely responsible for oxygenating the planet. So the cyanobacteria were the ones that oxygenated the entire planet, actually caused a mass extinction because the life that it evolved prior was uh, had evolved in the lower oxygen atmosphere. This is pretty cool. Uh, so there we go. Proteistins, little single-celled organisms. These guys have a variety of photosynthesizers. You have red algae, green algae, brown algae, right? So there are a variety of algae that can photosynthesize. Um, and there are an entire group of organisms called phytoplankton. Plankton, by the way, is just a word for organisms that cannot resist currents, right? Doesn't mean they can't swim, but it's this little teeny little organism. Here's my organism. Give it some legs, right? And it's in the water. And it might be able to move around a little bit to find food, but when you have a big water current like that, it's carried in the water current. Plankton cannot move against the currents. So, plant A is the kingdom of photosynthesizers that everybody knows. The plants. So, that's the green plants. So, uh, green algae. So, uh, we have green algae in the uh, proteists, and there's also specific green algae in the plants. Uh, so, Brown algae is a really cool photosynthesizer. If you've ever been to California, the kelp forests are these mass of colonial algae, uh, which is pretty cool. This, this whole giant uh, coastal, they almost look like trees when you're scuba diving, scuba diving in these waters. And these giant things that look like they have leaves and everything are just brown algae, colonial organisms. Even down here, where it kind of looks like they have roots, those are some of the colonial organisms special, specialized for attachment. 
and they just share the energy from photosynthesis. Pretty cool. Uh, then here's a large variety. Here are some beautiful green plants right here and here, some mosses. Uh, this is just a little photosynthetic protist called Euglena. Um, here's some more photosynthetic protists. These are diatoms. And then over here, we have these cool long chain photosynthetic organisms. These are the cyano. Whoa, hey, got away from us. These are the cyanobacteria. Ah, need to adjust this. The cyanobacteria. And this over here is also cyanobacteria in the water, which is pretty cool. That's oxygenating the atmosphere. All right. Well, it's showing up here now, huh? All right. So uh, the organelle that does photosynthesis, which one is it, people? Say it with me. Yes, you said it correctly. It's the chloroplast. So let's hit the chloroplast anatomy more specifically so that we can talk about photosynthesis in the chloroplast. It has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. It has the fluid inside is stroma. Right? Remember the mitochondria had mitochondrial matrix. The chloroplast has stroma. And then we have these little green poker chips in there. One poker chip is called a thylakoid. And then a stack of these poker chips is called a granum. And then you're going to have multiple stacks interconnected, right? And these are called grana. So these are green in color. Uh, and they are membranous structures that look like poker chips, and they contain the photosynthetic pigments. A pigment is any molecule that absorbs uh, that absorbs specific wavelengths. So a pigment has a specific color because it absorbs specific wavelengths. Uh, and then I said grana. So multiple stacks. Let's talk about those pigments, right? We can separate the photosynthetic pigments into the primary pigments and the accessory pigments. The primary pigment found in all green plants is chlorophyll alpha. All green plants and their green algae ancestor have chlorophyll alpha. Uh, this is not all photosynthetic organisms, right? So a lot of those photosynthetic bacteria have bacteriophils, which is pretty cool. Uh, so photosynthetic pigments specific to the bacteria. Accessory pigments are found in different amounts uh, in different plants. So we have chlorophyll beta, right? So... Um, this little structure stands for alpha, and this stands for beta, all right? Then we have the carotenoids. Beta carotene is an example of a carotenoid. It is orange. Uh, so uh, real quick, uh, a quick story, because I find it super cool. Uh, a lot of you have heard of beta carotene before you know that it is present in large amounts in carrots, right? And what do they tell you about eating your carrots? They say, eat your carrots because they will, what is it now? Improve your eyes. They're good for your eyes. Specifically, they, whoa, they give you good night vision. Have you all heard that before, right? Uh, so, 
They say carrots, because of the beta carotene, give you excellent night vision. They're healthy for your eyes. That is bunk. Pure bunk. So you might ask, how did something that is absolutely not true permeate into the entire culture? It seems ever-present. Everyone I talk to says beta carotene is good for your eyes. Well, the story is very cool. So our story goes all the way back uh, to World War II. Uh, and so during the Blitz in World War II, there were German bombers and fighters going over England constantly. And the Royal Air Force, the RAF, was extremely effective at scrambling and fighting those planes. So ex uh, exceptional at it that the Germans started to get a little curious why. See, the English had developed rudimentary radar. And so their radar installations on the coast, on the English Channel, could detect incoming German planes. They did not want to know the German planes to know about their radar installations, otherwise they'd get bombed. So the RAF and the, the British uh, intelligence decided to release a little bit of interesting propaganda, and that is that the RAF pilots were so good at spotting the German planes, even at night, because of the carrots containing beta-carotene that they ate. So uh, that was literally World War II propaganda to fool the Germans uh, into thinking the British had something that could uh, give them good vision uh, to, to fool the Germans into not seeing their radar. Which is really cool. Okay, so uh, continuing on. Uh, so we also have a class called the Xanthophils. Um, xanthophils are pretty cool. And finally, the anthocyanins. All of these pigments absorb different wavelengths of visible light at different rates and effectiveness. So, they're all about absorbing, absorbing visible light. They absorb specific wavelengths. So let's talk about what happens to light. So say you have an object, any object, and you have a light source, and light's coming off of it, and you have some light sensing structure. Here's your eyeball, right? So for this object to be seen, light has to get to your eyeball. So there are several things that can happen to light when it encounters an object. One, it can be transmitted through it. So it goes through the object. It can also be refracted when it's transmitting, which simply means the light bends. Anyway, either way, when it's transmitted, it can get to your eye. It can also be reflected off the object. Boink! And if it's reflected, right? Boink! It can get to your eye. It bounces off the surface. And then finally, light can be absorbed. So here comes my light, and it is absorbed. Boop! It cannot go anywhere. Can you see absorbed light? Well, look at the picture. Can the light get to the eye, to the sensing organ? No. So the light that is absorbed is not visible. So visible light is, absor uh, is uh, the color of an object is based on the light that is transmitted and reflected. The color of an object is what is transmitted and reflected. You do not see colors that are absorbed. 
So what's the wavelength least used by green plants here in the background? Well, I've said photosynthetic pigments absorb light in order for photosynthesis to occur. So when you look at those green plants, what's being absorbed the least? Well, that's what's being transmitted and reflected, and that's what you're seeing. And so you see green. Green wavelengths are the least used in photosynthesis. So here we go. Here's wavelengths of light coming in, and then we mostly get green and yellow reflected off, and that's why plant leaves appear greenish yellow. All right, so you have in a given chloroplast, most of the photosynthetic pigments are chlorophyll alpha, the primary pigment. So here's your thylakoid, right? Yeah, I've got too many membranes. Let's do, let's do it up here. There's a thylakoid, and we've got photosynthetic pigments in there. And most of those pigments are the primary pigment. That's why it's called primary. It's photosyn uh, chlor yeah, blah, blah. Chlorophyll alpha. All right? And then we have the accessory pigments. Um, and those are our beta carotenes, maybe. Our, well, let's make these chlorophyll beta, right? We also have um, our uh, our beta carotenes, right? Uh, do, do, do. Down, down, down. Beta carotene, like the carotenoids. Right, and then we have our xanthophylls. And our anthocyanins all packed in there. into a thylakoid. So all of those are packed into a thylakoid. So the whole role is to absorb light. So our chlorophyll alpha absorbs a specific set of wavelengths, and then all our accessory pigments absorb slightly different ranges of wavelengths, and this overall expands the amount of light, the wavelengths of light we can absorb. So here's a visible spectrum again. Chlorophyll alpha can absorb in the 400 to 450 nanometer range, um, yeah, which is the violets. Uh, and then it also absorbs in the... Uh, so it'll absorb in this violet to a little bit of blue range, and it also absorbs in the 650 to 700 nanometer range, right? So some violets and blues and some reds, right? And then we also have our chlorophyll beta, uh, again, in the 450 to 500 nanometer range, right here, and the 600 to 650. So a little bit of the yellows and some of that orange and reds. And then we have those carotenoids doing our good old fashioned uh, 400 to 530. So it's overlapping a little bit with the others and it gets a little bit nearer that green. So there's some of our carotenoids. And xanthophylls, anthocyanins also expand this. But I'm not going to go all into all of those. So, but here we go. 
Alpha, beta, and the carotenoids are the most commonly discussed ones. And so just like we mentioned, uh, they have this range. So here's the carotenoids right here. And this is the wavelength they're absorbing. Some good wavelength absorption, especially in that uh, 450 to 530 range. And then you have your alpha uh, right here. And then you have your, so here's your alpha. Right here. Right, pretty much nothing down here. And then spikes again down there. Whoa! Woo! Awesome pages. Okay. And then finally you have your beta. Uh, and your beta, um, your beta does another set of wavelengths, helps expand it. So when you look at that, woo, okay, got it back. When you look at the total wavelengths absorbed, uh, you get a much larger range. Right, so down here we can see the combination of the wavelengths we see up here. These are the specific wavelengths these are absorbing, and this is our total absorption with all of those pigments in there. Uh, so the accessory expand that, and you'll see down here we have that basic no absorption. And what is that? Oh, look. It's the greenish yellow. So there we go. So our peaks are in the 400 to 530 and 600 to 700 nanometer. So the blues and violets uh, and the reds. So pretty cool. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the specific formula of photosynthesis, and let's get into our beautiful details. Got my pointer back. Oh, man, it is freaking out. Go back to my mouse. Uh, so... I have to erase the ink. There we go. I got it. All right. So this is our basic formula for photosynthesis right here. Uh, it is a... A, a series of oxidation reduction reactions in which we have our inorganic uh, ingredients, 6H2O and 6CO2. These are inorganic, and we're going to use energy to convert them into our organic fuel, C6H12O6, and we'll have oxygen as a byproduct. So what's our energy source? Huh? Is it perhaps sunlight? Yeah, you guys knew that. Uh, so our energy source is light. And we have our 6H2O right over here. Uh, and remember, oxidation reduction, right? So oxidation reduction in biology. So oxidation is where we lose electrons. In biology, when we lose electrons, we'll often see that we lose hydrogen. And reduction is where you gain electrons. And in biology, you'll see that we gain hydrogen. So in photosynthesis, we'll see what's oxidized and reduced based on what loses hydrogen and what gains hydrogen. So water is oxidized. We lose the hydrogen. 
And when we lose that hydrogen, we just have oxygen left. So our product of oxidation of water is oxygen. Um, and we actually split those water molecules directly. There's this really cool physical structure inside a plant that seems to be able to just directly smash the water molecule and split it into its components, which is pretty cool. Uh, all right. The water is oxidized, so the CO2 is reduced. Uh, so our CO2 is reduced with those hydrogens from water, right? We had, we had our 6H2O, and it lost its hydrogens. And 6 times H2 is 12, right? That's pretty convenient. So uh, our 6H2O is the... Uh, our 6H2O is oxidized, and those 12 hydrogens are added to our CO2. So carbon dioxide is reduced to produce our glucose. I'm losing track of what I'm saying because my little pin thing keeps uh, getting screwy. So we use energy from sunlight. We take our inorganic sources, and we oxidize water, and we reduce carbon dioxide. So our hydrogens from water reduce the carbon dioxide, and we get C6H12O6. And when we oxidize water, we just have oxygen left, and we get our O2. So let's talk about how all of this works. And to talk about how all of this works, we're gonna to need to talk about excitation. So I'm gonna draw an atom. Here's my nucleus. Here's one orbital. Here's an or another orbital. We'll make this neon, which has an atomic number of 10. We have two in the innermost orbital of electrons, because there's always two in the innermost. And then there's eight in the valence. There we go. Electron excitation is where you have energy added to a atom or molecule. And that energy is absorbed by the molecule and causes an electron to jump. And that electron jumps to a higher orbital. Now this orbital is not particularly stable. It has one electron in it. And down here we now have seven electrons, which means it's very thirsty for an electron. So this electron basically just gets thrown back down into its original orbit, and it releases heat and light. Electron excitation is a major component of photosynthesis. It's how we get the whole thing going, because remember, it's based on oxidation reduction, so we need electrons for oxidation and reduction to occur. All right, so uh, white travels as waves and rays, carrying energy. Uh, so the energy from light is carried by something called a photon. Uh, so the photon is, you could think of it as a uh, light energy. It's not a molecule, but it's a unit a little unit of light energy. So that's a photon, a unit of light energy. Has no mass, so it's not matter. It's just energy from light. So uh, 
when we're talking about wavelengths of light being absorbed, we'll talk about the rays. Then we also talk about the waves of light, and we'll talk about the photons carried in it, right? And so when those photons are absorbed by a molecule, that's the energy source. So those photons are mo uh, absorbed. We knock an electron up out of its orbital into a next one, very unstable, so it drops back down, and we get our heat and our light. So uh, pigments can absorb photons, and when they absorb the photons, electrons are excited. And there we go. Pops up an orbital. This increases the potential energy of the system, making it less stable. Then the electron drops back down, expressing that potential energy as heat and light. Uh, so this is really cool. Um, this is just a beaker of chlorophyll. Uh, so this beaker has chlorophyll. Basically, they probably blended up a plant, maybe spinach. People like to blend spinach. Anyway, uh, and then they shined an ultraviolet light on it. And it excited the pigments, the photosynthetic pigments in there. And they popped their electrons up. And then their electrons popped down, releasing light and heat. My example of neon, right, is the, the energy source for a fluorescent light bulb, right? A fluorescent light bulb, like a neon light. Uh, we put electricity into it. Zzz, and the electricity is absorbed, causing that electron excitation to occur, and we get light for our fluorescent lights. Anyway, uh, that was a silly video I made, but I just talked about it already. You can watch the video if you want. <laughs> Let's break down the details of photosynthesis into two separate phases, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. Light reactions consist of two distinct portions. Uh, when do you suppose the light reactions occur? What time of day? Maybe? Perhaps? When the sun is out, they require light? Yes. Scientists actually named it logically. Hooray! The two distinct phases are photosystem two, uh, photosystem two and photosystem one, PS2, PS1. You will notice that I listed them the opposite of numerical order, right? Why did I do that? Well, that's because photosystem two occurs first in the light reactions. It occurs before photosystem one. So why is photosystem two the first one, two, and photosystem one, the second one, one, uh, it has to do on uh, with when they were discovered. Photosystem 1 was discovered first. Then Photosystem 2 was discovered later on. And why they kept them as 1 and 2 and, and making it go 2 and 1, I don't know. I feel like I started to get unintelligible there. Anyway, moving on. The products of the light reactions are 1 ATP. You'll note that remembering that photosynthesis is endergonic, will need energy, so there's our energy source, and one NADPH. You'll remember from uh, <clears throat> cellular respiration, NAD was a molecule that could get reduced into NAD, whoa, hey, come on now. NADH, right? Well, NADP is a plant-specific electron carrier that can be reduced to NADPH, right? So, boom. The Calvin cycle is the second portion, the second phase. We take ATP and NADPH, right? So our H's, right? These are released from the oxidation of water. And our ATP, and we feed it in 
to the Calvin cycle, and the Calvin cycle is all about reducing CO2. In other words, taking the hydrogen that from our NADPH and adding it to the CO2. So our products of the Calvin cycle is the organic sugar molecule. So there you go, the Calvin cycle and the light cycle. It's in reverse order. So we take our hydrogen from NADPH, we reduce carbon dioxide. We have to use our energy in the form of ATP to do it. And then once we reduce it, we're going to get our sugar. Woo! Photosystem 2. Right? Photosystem 2 occurs first. Let's get rid of this since it's showing up on the next screen. There we go. Nice and pretty. Photosystem 2 occurs first, right? And it consists of our pigments absorbing a photon. <sighs> Lost a lot of stuff. So here's my photosynthetic pigment. Here comes a wave of light carrying a photon, and it gets absorbed. And the energy carried causes electron excitation. And it releases two electrons. These electrons are carried to an electron transport chain. So here's an electron transport chain. Not going to draw it out like I did cellular respiration. So our electrons are carried to an electron transport chain. And at the same time, we split our water into hydrogen and oxygen. Our oxygen is released as a gas. Our hydrogen, when it's split, we have two hydrogen molecules. So we'll draw them up as 2H. And in fact... They are protons. Because we split out our two electrons in order to replace the electrons lost in excitation. Right? Because we take our electrons and send them down an electron transport chain, they are not returned, like we do not return them to the photosynthetic pigment. No. Instead, now that our photosynthetic pigment has essentially permanently lost two electrons, we're going to have to replace them. We replace them with the electrons released from our, <clears throat> from our splitting of water. So we release oxygen as gas, and our electrons uh, go to replace the electrons lost, and our hydrogens also go to the electron transport chain. So electrons to the pigment, hydrogen here, and electrons here to the electron transport chain. Photosystem 2 feeds into photosystem 1. So in photosystem 1, Right, so let's just have, we'll have the electron transport chain that was in photosystem two, the first part, right? And we remember we put our hydrogens into that electron transport chain. Well, ATP is synthase is there, right? And remember, it's a hydrogen pump connected to an enzyme. So this proton, our hydrogen goes down through our proton, goes through the proton pump, and we have ADP plus P converted into ATP. Now, uh, we get our one 
ATP needed for reduction of glucose. And then we have another electron transport chain. So here's electron transport chain number two. Our proton is passed over to electron transport chain two. And then we have our NADP pick up that proton to become NADPH. We had our proton. Let's just draw a little circle with a plus. Our proton went through electron transport chain one. Then our proton went through electron transport chain two. And we had the production of ATP. Right. And then we also had our electrons. So over here, we had a photosynthetic pigment. Light came in, caused the electron excitation that caused all this whole thing in the first place. Right. And then we lost two electrons. But luckily, we had H2O split. And we got some electrons to replace the ones we lost. All right? Well, again, we have electron excitation. And we lose electrons. And they go into this one here, right? But remember, these electrons over here, oh, man, got all screwy again. These electrons over here went through here, and now they can go here to replace the ones lost from excitation. So, photosystem two, we have our pigment, we have two electrons excited, and we have two electrons from water coming in to replace them. Goes down an electron transport chain. And then they're passed over here. Uh, and we have in photosystem two, or photosystem one, another set of two electrons excited, and they go down an electron transport chain. So the electrons here that were excited go down the electron transport chain, passed over here, and replace the electrons lost. So that's the fate there. Ugh. Right, so our two electrons from photosystem two, or our two electrons excited in photosystem one, head down the electron transport chain. Our two electrons from an electron transport chain one, replace those lost from excitation in the pigments. In electron transport chain two, we now have two protons and two electrons, and they, are, they reduce NADP to NADPH, NADPH and ATP, Go to the Calvin cycle. Whew. Okay. Let's try this again, right? So pigment, pigment, separate this out. Electron excitation. Electron transport chain. Two electrons, right? H2O. Split. O2 given off. Electrons replace the ones lost. 
This is photosystem 2. We're trying to combine electrons and protons now. Okay. So, then we have electron excitation. And these electrons, boop, sent back down. Right? At the same time, our protons here that went down here, came down here to synthase. We have those protons come down here. So we have two electrons, two protons coming down the transport chain where NADP picks them up and becomes 2-NADPH. So you get, for every glucose, you get a net of uh, 1 in ADPH and 1 in ATP, and this happens very quickly. So uh, you get lots of NADPH and lots of ATP in a very short period of time. And our NADPH, right, and our ATP go to the Calvin cycle. Here's our light reactions. Light coming in, right? Being absorbed. Water being used, right? Split. We split the water and we release oxygen. When we split the water, the water is being oxidized. Our two electrons replace those lost from the pigment. We have two separate electron transport chains. Uh, we have another set of excitation. Uh, ultimate product is 1 ATP, 1 NADPH. All right, so here's the ATP. Here's the NADPH. They go into the Calvin cycle. Carbon dioxide is fed into the Calvin cycle. And the product is sugar. So here's a good sort of light reaction thing in which we have photosystem 2, electron transport chain. Photosystem 1, electron transport chain. Uh, and we get our ATP in ADPH. <laughs> one ATP from what we call photophosphorylation. Remember in cellular respiration, there was substrate level phosphorylation, uh, and then there was the phosphorylation with ATP synthase. Now we have photophosphorylation in ADPH. There are three phases we'll talk about in the Calvin cycle. And they start off with 3CO2 entering the system. So, this is a cycle of reactions. As long as we're feeding CO2 into the system, these reactions can occur. So we'll feed 3CO2 in. We'll have carbon fixation. And we'll have, and so the first phase we're talking about is carbon fixation. So uh, let's clear this off. All right, carbon fixation is where we have carbon dioxide with 3-RUBP. So, 
Here's our three carbon dioxide entering the cycle. Ribulose biphosphate is RUBP. RUBP plus CO2 produces three rubisco. You don't have to know what rubisco is, but we get three rubisco. Three rubisco is broken up into six separate molecules. You do not have to know the names of these molecules, just that we break it down into six. So, RUBP is combined with carbon dioxide to produce rubisco. Then we get six molecules out of it. Phase two is actual reduction. So, we're going to start off with our six molecules, right? And we're going to reduce them, which means we're adding hydrogen. This costs 6 and ADPH, right? So we're going to have our NADPH bring in our hydrogens. Converting it into NADP. And that goes back to the light reactions, right? So we bring in our hydrogen to add, to reduce, and we need to burn six ATP to do this. And then we'll produce our ADP plus P, and that goes back to the light reactions. And the ultimate result of this is six G3P sugars. Not glucose, but G3P. Phase three is RUBP regeneration. So in RUBP regeneration, right, because remember at the beginning of the Calvin cycle, we had RUBP. plus the three CO2 entering the system, producing Rubisco. All right? Well, we have to have a constant supply of RUBP. So we'll ignore the six molecules, and so we'll just ignore the breaking down into six molecules. We'll ignore the... the drawing up of reduction, and we'll just draw up our 6G3P, all right? Well, uh, ignoring all the specific reactions that take place, basically we need 5G3P to regenerate RUBP, which means the ultimate product of phase 3 is 1 G3P sugar. This costs an additional 3 ATP. So, a lot of stuff goes on, and the ultimate product of all of this is one G3P sugar available for use by the plant. It can convert this into good old glucose but it can also convert it into other molecules that are necessary. So here we go. Here's our three phases. So here's our carbon dioxide coming in. Here's our RUBP, and we get Rubisco. And then we break it down into uh, these uh, six molecules. So there we go, six molecules. These six molecules are reduced, costs us ATP, and it costs us NADPH. And that reduction gets us 6G3P, right? 
one of which is released, five of which go into regenerating our UBP, which costs ATP. Our final tally, our gross product, we get 6G3P, which is our gross, remember, but five go into our UBP regeneration. So the cost is 9 ATP. Five G3P for our RUBP regeneration and six in ADPH. Our net, what is finally available for the plant is one, count them one G3P. And of course our ADP plus P goes into the light reactions and our NADP goes into the light reactions where we can generate ATP and NADPH and do the whole thing over again. So there are several different ways this can all happen. Uh, so call it different types of photosynthesis. There are names for each of them. Uh, so we have the term for photosynthesis we can call photorespiration. And photorespiration is intimately in, uh, associated with evapotranspiration. This is an important concept, evapotranspiration. So say here's my little cell, right? I need to take in carbon dioxide into the cell. So I need atmospheric CO2 into the cell. So that means my cell is taking in air. <laughs> Anytime my cell is taking in air, it's losing water. Evaporation, right? So simply because of heat or wind, we lose water. So evapotranspiration includes evaporation from heat or wind, right? So we have to be able, because our water is also needed in photosynthesis, we have to be able to modulate how much carbon dioxide we're taking in versus how much water we're losing. There are different methods for doing this. One is called C3. This is the vanilla type of, of uh, photosynthesis we just discussed, in which there's no special particular method in which we modulate our water loss, right? Carbon dioxide comes in and we lose some water. Works pretty well in moderate climates. But when your climate changes, you may need C4 photosynthesis in which the light reactions and the Calvin cycle occur separately from one another. So, so here's my cell for the light reactions and here's my cell for the Calvin cycle. So our light reactions take up our water, right? They go in here and we get our light reactions. We get our ATP and we get our NADPH. Our Calvin cycle occurs in a different cell, an insulated cell right here. So we've got a layer of cells on the outside doing some light reactions getting water from the roots. And then we'll have our carbon dioxide getting pulled in from a number of these cells. And each of these cells can sort of turn on or shut off our carbon dioxide, right? So the carbon dioxide gets pulled in
and then it gets transferred to the Calvin cycle. So our Calvin cycle occurs uh, separately from our light reactions. And this helps uh, reduce the amount of uh, water lost when we absorb our carbon dioxide for the Calvin cycle. Right? Instead of just doing all of it at the same time in which we transfer our water in and then start losing it as soon as we pull in our carbon dioxide, instead we have our light reactions occurring in our special cell right here. And then we have our Calvin cycle occurring in a separate cell. So when we use that carbon dioxide, we're not opening up to the environment and losing it. So this is great in hot, sunny areas right here. Corn that grows in hot, sunny climates, sugarcane, crabgrass, all examples of C4. Finally, we have CAM photosynthesis, where we do the light reaction. So we're in one cell again. But since we're getting our water from the roots, right, we get our water in, and we have the light reactions occur during the day. And then we have our Oh my goodness! We have our um, our Calvin cycle occur at night. So our night time when we have cooler temperatures, and then. When we absorb, when we open up to absorb our carbon dioxide, we have lower water loss. By the way, it's at night when they release their oxygen, too, because it builds up, right, during the day. So, bring in our carbon dioxide at night, and then we can get our... sugars. This is great in very hot, very dry climates, like a desert. So you'll see cam in cactus.